So we begin with the accusation aiding in genocide. Hearings began today at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, where Nicaragua is claiming that Germany is, and I'm quoting here, facilitating the commission of genocide in the Gaza Strip. Nicaragua is arguing that Germany is breaching international law by supplying weapons to Israel for its military campaign against Hamas. Germany has rejected Nicaragua's accusations. Israel has also repeatedly denied committing genocide or war crimes in its response to Hamas's October 7th terrorist attacks. Nicaragua's case against Germany has two main goals. To halt Berlin's military exports to Israel and to restart German funding for the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency. Their argument that Germany's actions are in breach of the Genocide Convention. Germany is failing to honor its own obligation to prevent genocide or to ensure respect of international humanitarian law. Germany's supply of arms to Israel is a central pillar of Nicaragua's case. Germany is Israel's second largest arms supplier behind the United States, accounting for about 30% of all Israel's weapon imports. Nicaragua argues that by continuing to provide these weapons, Germany is enabling Israel to commit acts of genocide in Gaza. The International Court of Justice is currently examining whether Israel has committed genocide in a separate case launched by South Africa. In bringing this case before the court, Nicaragua says it is acting on behalf of the Palestinian people. I mean, this is a very important case, obviously, for our Palestinian brothers, but also for the people of Nicaragua. As you may have heard in our expression, in Nicaragua we have enormous sympathy with the Palestinians, with the suffering the Palestinian people are going through. And that's why we felt that we had to do something. Obviously, the only thing Nicaragua can do is use the few recourses it has. And one of the few things that Nicaragua had is some experience with the International Court of Justice. Close ties between Nicaragua and Palestinian organizations date back to 1979, when Palestinian groups supported the Sandinista guerrilla forces that overthrew Nicaragua's dictatorship. Germany's staunch support of Israel goes back to just after the Second World War. The German government sees supporting Israel's security as a historical responsibility for Germany's actions in the Holocaust. Berlin categorically rejects Nicaragua's accusations. Germany does not and never did violate the Genocide Convention nor international humanitarian law, neither directly nor indirectly. Germany will get its chance to make its case in court on Tuesday. Well, my first guest tonight brings a wealth of experience in international criminal justice. In 2001, he led the prosecution of the former president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, in front of the International Criminal Court. I'm happy to welcome tonight Mr. Jeffrey Nice. He joins me from London. Mr. Nice, it's good to have you with us. This case before the court now, Nicaragua aiming at Germany in connection with Israel, the Palestinians in Gaza, the accusation of genocide. T to the outside observer, this may not seem intuitive at all. What is the reasoning behind this lawsuit, in your opinion? Um, it is actually quite intuitive, I think. If, for example, you know that your neighbor's about to do something to the neighbor's partner, and you provide the neighbor with a gun, but the neighbor uses it, then of course you're responsible for the crime that, in part, for the crime that the neighbor commits. So it's quite easy to understand. And what's being said here, and it's not just in respect of your country, but also uh, extensively in respect of the United Kingdom as well as in America, is that if the time has come, and many people think it has, when uh, Israel's conduct of the war can no longer be justified in war of law terms, then if you provide weapons to such a country, you're becoming a partner in breaking the law of war. Further, if uh, there's any evidence of genocide by Israel, and you know that there may be genocide going on, then obviously you can't be complicit in genocide. Mm -hmm. But more than that, as the ambassador of Nicaragua to The Hague explained in his address to camera, 
the genocide convention of which many countries are um, parties, state parties, such as our own country and your country, um, Article 1 says as soon as genocide happens, you have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Now, depends on the circumstances. If genocide's happening in a neighboring country and it is something like the horrors of the Holocaust, then maybe you have to take very strong physical action. But would it make more uh, sense, Mr. Rex, would it make more sense for Nicaragua to, to aim at the United States, since you're talking about your neighbor? We know that that's not possible in this case, right, though? Well, <laughs> that's a matter for Nicaragua. Uh, but they've chosen to go against Germany on the basis that Germany is a very substantial supplier of arms, and that's open to them as a political decision. I can't help with why they didn't make the... The, the other decision, that's the one that they've made. I think it's very important for people to understand, and it's been lost for 70 years since the Genocide Convention came into being in 1952, that those who accede or rati to or ratify the convention mm -hmm. owe this absolutely telling duty the minute genocide may be committed. And you can understand why. It's all apart from the fact that people who drafted the Genocide Convention knew exactly what they spoke about. They'd been in one war, probably in two, and they'd seen the horrors of the uh, concentration camps in, within the last 12 months. So they knew exactly what was going on. But it's all based, if you, if you think about it, on the concept that humanity is single. And if humanity is single, then the mental state required to prove genocide, which is that you intend to destroy another bit of humanity simply because of who they are, whether it's Jewish people or whether it's people in Rwanda or uh, Armenians and so on, mm -hmm. if you intend to do that, you're doing something utterly dreadful because you're destroying yourselves. But, but Mr. Nice, not all of humanity is, is, is a member of the International Criminal Court. The United States doesn't recognize this court, for example. And I, I'm wondering, since Germany does, is Germany being targeted by Nicaragua simply because it's the next best thing that can be targeted? Could easily be. I'm afraid you'll have to ask your political experts about that because it's outside my sphere of expertise. But there have been plenty, plenty of examples over recent years, tragic examples of how powerful countries have stood in the way of justice uh, or attempts to deliver justice. And I think mm -hmm. if you were to go out and ask the citizen on the streets of Germany or Britain or anywhere else at the moment, most of them would say, for goodness sake, let's stop the fighting. And for goodness sake, let's have this matter properly adjudicated by an independent tribunal. And if it happens to be Hamas only who are culpable, so be it, because obviously Hamas are culpable. They, what they did is without doubt criminal. Mm -hmm. But equally, if there's evidence that Israel may be criminal, then that has to be tested. And what you're not hearing from the political leaders of the big countries is that they agree that there should be a, a trial, criminal or uh, in the ICJ, which is not a criminal court, as mm. you know. It's a different yes. kind of court. The, the protection mm. and survival of the state of Israel, it is part of Germany's reason of state, part of the, the DNA, if you will, of the German body politic. Has this commitment, has it made Berlin especially vulnerable to legal challenges like what we're seeing right now? I'm not sure that it's made Germany especially vulnerable. The creation of the State of Israel, which started at the beginning of the 19th century with the Balfour Declaration made by uh, an English minister, um, and then has been supported by many countries, notably the United States of America, but other countries since, is a, is a response to the terrible things that happened to the Jewish people, not just in World War II, but for centuries, or indeed millennia, because of rampant anti-Semitism, which has existed all around the globe. Mm -hmm. That's one development. As soon as it was happening, all those involved who weren't either Palestinians or uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish state people themselves surely mm -hmm. should have recognized that this was an inevitable problem that was coming, and the Zionist founders of Israel saw that. And I think it's more important perhaps, but again, I'm straying outside my expertise, mm -hmm. it's more important, in fact, to look at what the big and powerful countries in the United Nations itself have not done over the last several decades to enforce either a two-state solution or a one-state mm -hmm. solution. 
and to resolve this problem. And so you've got two problems in parallel. Mm -hmm. How we must honor what we've always tried to honor in respect of the Jewish people and the Jewish state, but how there's a parallel problem, not of their own initial creation with the mm -hmm. Palestinian people, but which citizens around the world feel very strongly. I want to ask you, before we run out of time, you have chaired two tribunals at the court, the, the Uyghur and the, the China Tribunal. In the Uyghur Tribunal, the conclusion was that China had committed genocide under Article 2 of the 1949 Genoc Genocide Convention. You've been quoted as saying yes. at the time that there was no other way of bringing the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party collectively or individually to judgment. Does that also apply today to Israel and or its allies in the claim of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza? No, it's slightly different. Uh, the, what I was saying there was that China is probably at, at most vulnerable to the International Court of Justice, and that's why our one of the five... We only found, made, we made a finding of one out of five possible forms of genocide. Mm -hmm. But we did make it, and we made it with absolute uh, clarity beyond reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that's different from the position in, so far as Israel is concerned. Israel, Hamas, always remember both sides and always mm. remember that Hamas has no defense to what it did on the 7th of October. The, the International Criminal Court, a world court, sort of, except that a large part of the world mm. is not signed up to it, but it does have jurisdiction over Israel. And therefore, it is in a position and it it has said as much, although America and Great Britain, and I dare say Germany, doesn't want it to say this. It has jurisdiction over what's mm. happening, okay. involving both, concerning both Hamas and um, uh, the, the Israeli Defense Force and the Israeli political leadership, but okay. also quite possibly if any other countries get involved on the ground, because the, the basis for jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in Gaza is the submission to jurisdiction by the Palestinian Authority in, 90, in 2015, immediately mm -hmm. after or shortly after the end of the last major war, Operation Protective Edge. Right. And it submitted jurisdiction to the ICC for both the West Bank territories and for Gaza. Mm -hmm. Mr. Knights, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we certainly appreciate you taking the time to help um, give us a critical analysis of what's going on. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's bring in Dr. Lawrence Hill Cawthorn. He's an associate professor in law and co-director at the Centre for International Law at the University of Bristol in the UK. Uh, now, what is the reason behind this lawsuit, in your opinion? Hi there. Well, so, so the lawsuit alle alleges Germany's responsibility for, for several violations of international law, um, both in respect of its failure to prevent violations within Gaza, including its failure to prevent genocide, its failure to prevent violations of the laws of armed conflict, and in its actual support, its aid and assistance, particularly in the form of weapons transfers to Israel. And much of this arises, much of the, the case in a way arises from an earlier case instituted in, in January brought by South Africa against Israel in relation to the assault on Gaza, in which uh, South Africa alleges that genocide is, is being committed in Gaza itself. Mm. And in legal terms, does Nicaragua have a case here? Well, yes, it does. Uh, and, and certainly Nicaragua is not the, the first state or, 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 or entity to allege these kinds of violations being committed in Gaza. Uh, we have had the, the UN Secretary General um, make these points, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, a number of UN Special Rapporteurs have, have all argued that there is a, a risk of genocide being committed in Gaza. The International Court of Justice stated in January that there's a risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights of Palestinians to be protected from genocide. And even domestic courts have, have started intervening. The Netherlands Dutch Court of Appeal, um, for example, ordered the suspension of arms sales to Israel on the basis of uh, a clear risk that they'd be used to commit violations of the law of armed conflict. Mm. So there's quite a lot of uh, clear evidence of, of, of serious risks of violations of international law being committed in Gaza. Hmm. Now, why do you think it is Nicaragua, of all countries, uh, filing this case? Yeah, it, it's a very good question. Nicaragua is actually a, a common litigant 
case before the International Court of Justice. So, so, so it's appeared quite frequently before the court. Um, many of those cases concern its neighbors in, in Central and South America, but some have concerned other states. And in particular, 40 years ago, uh, Nicaragua brought a case against the United States for the U.S.'s um, intervention and support of, of uh, rebel groups within Nicaragua itself, and that was alluded to by Nicaragua's agent this morning in the court. It's also the case that this is an example of, of what we might think of as public interest litigation where an applicant state is bringing a case against another state, not as such on the basis of harm being committed to the applicant state, but rather in order to protect particular interests of the entire international community. And that's something we've seen increasingly in the last, mm. last 10 to 15 years. Uh, Germany says that this case is, quote, grossly biased. What do you say? Well, I, I, as I said before, I think there's a considerable amount of publicly available evidence from very authoritative sources that serious violations of international law are being committed in Gaza. And those violations are such that they not only entail the responsibility of Israel, but they can also entail the responsibility of every other state in the world for failing to prevent those violations and for aiding and assisting in those violations. So I actually think the argument on the merits is quite a strong one. Uh, is, with this lawsuit, Germany serving as a scapegoat for the United States? Well, of course, there'll be implications for other states, and the U.S. is, is the principal arms exporter to, to Israel. Uh, so an order from the ICJ to suspend weapons transfers to Israel um, would therefore be, be an important consideration for the U.S. as well. But Germany is the second principal exporter of arms to Israel, accounting for something like 30% of arms exports to Israel. And the obligations being invoked by Nicaragua in this case uh, clearly relate to the, to the actual acts and responsibilities of Germany itself. So I, I, I think, I don't think this is as such using Germany as a scapegoat for the US. It's about Germany's independent responsibility. Thank you very much, Lawrence Hill Cawthorn from the Centre of International Law at Bristol University.